over the 70s. What had become of abstract painting once the glory of the New York School? Great claims had been made for colour field painting as the inevitable successor to abstract expressionism, the sole bearer of high seriousness. Huge lyrical canvases, stains and soaks of transparent colour by artists like Helen Frankenthaler. These watercolours writ large were often very beautiful when they weren't just being intelligently pretty. They offered nothing but disinterested pleasure and they became, for a time, the official art, the salon art of America. But to me, the best abstract painter of the time wasn't in New York at all. His name was Richard Diebenkorn, and he lived and worked in Ocean Park, a beachside suburb of Los Angeles. Preserving the high light and the diagonal cuts and the tonal balance, Diebenkorn's work moved towards the grandly ordered images of coast, sea and sky in his Ocean Park paintings, abstractions which don't reject the world but contain it in a concentrated form. Richard Diebenkorn was a mediator between abstraction and natural vision. He painted some of the most intelligent responses to Matisse that any American had done. Blue Pacific air, slices of gable, white posts by the sea, an enveloping light like no other in American painting. But different artists see different Americans. It was supposed to be a non-violent demonstration today. The politically violent America of the late 60s and 70s, the America of the war, the protests, the furies unleashed at the 1968 Democratic Convention, radically changed the work of the highly respected abstract painter Philip Guston and he changed the direction of American painting after 1970. As an abstract artist, Guston was known for his refined veils of paint. He'd begun as a figure painter in the 1930s, and many of his early works are images of social evil, like The Conspirators from 1932, a painting now lost, with its Ku Klux Klansman holding a whip. There had always been a storyteller inside the abstract artist, and now, in middle age, Guston let him out. I think my father experienced a crisis in his development as an artist. He was widely quoted for saying, I wanted to tell stories. I got sick and tired of all that purity. By which he meant, of course, um, the purity and, and perhaps minimalism by that point of abstract art. He said, how can I go into my studio and adjust a red to a blue when all of this is happening in the world? He felt that he had to respond to the world outside. I began <clears throat> drawing a subject which I dealt with many years ago of uh, hooded figures. They're obviously based on Ku Klux Klan figures. But I didn't mean to make a story about the Ku Klux Klan. I'm just using them as a, I suppose you'd call it a symbol. Guston's Klansmen are both ludicrous and menacing. Red of neck and white of sheet, they ride around in jalopies, up to no good, with blood on their robes. They are characters in the Commedia dell'arte of an America deep in a social and political crisis. But Guston's Klansmen were obsolete characters. By 1970, the Ku Klux Klan was insignificant compared to real events. Your order to disperse. The Klan paintings were forced into existence by a political environment they didn't actually show. 
I shall resign, Presidency, presidency effective at noon tomorrow. These klutzy images seemed a breach of etiquette, a treason to the artist's own serious past. But from there until his death, Guston's work only gathered intensity. Younger postmodernists pillaged his work for its grunge and irony, but Guston wasn't in any sense a postmodernist. He was a tragic painter with a deeply felt relation to history. This painting, The Street, is based on Paolo Uccello with boots instead of horses' hooves and trash can lids for shields. And there was nothing feigned about his despair. This painting, with its pathetic boots and the fires on the stony horizon, is called simply Pit. Out of the slang of comic strips, Philip Guston brought an immense sadness about human fate. Out of his pessimism about America, a lumpish beauty. He died in 1980, completely out of sync, as always, with the sunny fantasy of America that was coming. I've always believed that this land was placed here between the two great oceans by some divine plan. It was placed here to be found by a special kind of people. People who had a special love for freedom and who had the courage to come to what in the beginning was the most undeveloped wilderness possible. Ronald Reagan's immense appeal to Americans lay in offering them the rebirth of an America that had been lost in the conflicts and humiliations of the 60s and 70s victorious, leading the world, buoyant with the virtues of the mythic West. For 200 years, we've lived in the future, believing that tomorrow would be better than today and today would be better than yesterday. I still believe that. We can meet our destiny and that destiny to build a land here that will be for all mankind a shining city on a hill. This is not the Oval Office of the White House in Washington. It is in the Simi Valley, north of Los Angeles, in the Ronald Reagan Presidential Library, a movie set replica of the real stage on which the former actor worked in real life. Ronald Reagan, like most American presidents, including John Kennedy, had no particular interest in the visual arts, beyond film, of course. Yet his presidency had large indirect effects upon the American art world, more, perhaps, than anyone's since Franklin Roosevelt's. Why? Because in the course of quadrupling America's national deficit to about a trillion dollars and filling the country with oceans of borrowed money, his economic policies created the art boom of the 1980s. This bubble had a blinding iridescence while it lasted, and every new investor was aware that if he bought new art, he'd come up smelling like Lorenzo de' Medici's aftershave. Pace gallery. The art dealers, of course, were high in hog heaven, floating on clouds of sanctimony. Maria, I know most of the people who are collecting in the art world, whether they buy from me or not, and I probably will know something about you. And then I'll have to make a judgment. Will I take a chance on affiliating you to the gallery by letting you have one of these paintings? Now, that sounds terribly arrogant, but it really, it's true. Anybody who gets one of these paintings is receiving a prize. A booby prize sometimes, like a Julian Schnabel. His congested paintings with their broken plates and earnest, incompetent drawing made him a great favourite among those who yearned for the hot and the heavy. Schnabel was a monument of self-esteem who once compared himself to Giotto and Van Gogh. The patron saint of this inflation was Andy Warhol. It was Andy who demystified the art world by calling it by its real name, a business, a promotional system swept by tides of fashion and snobbery. After his death in 1987, there was a giant auction of his things. Andy must have been smiling down from heaven when his flea market cookie jars came on the block 
and the relic hunters went crazy. At 18, $19,000, $20,000 on the right. At 20,000, 21,000. At 21,000, fair warning. $21,000! If cheap cookie jars could become treasures in the 1980s, then how much more the work of the very egregious Jeff Coons, a former bond trader whose ambitions took him right through kitsch and out the other side into a vulgarity so syrupy, gross and numbing that collectors felt challenged by it. Sometimes his work...